Hi there, my highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The virtual clinical pharmacy institute with a difference where patient safety, medication therapy management, and optimal clinical outcomes are very, very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for very high impact pharmacotherapy services. So I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I welcome you all to part 119 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series which measures in infectious diseases. Welcome. And the first question reads, which of the characteristics listed below improve antibiotic penetration into the CNS? Is it high polarity that is carrying a charge at physiologic pH? Is it high molecular weight? Is it high protein binding? Is it high lipophilicity? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. D is the correct answer, high lipophilicity. Now, high lipophilicity, low protein binding, low molecular weight, and low polarity are characteristics or PK parameters that would predict good penetration across the blood-brain barrier. Now, of those listed above, D is the correct response. So, answers A to C are all wrong. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the statements listed below is correct or accurate regarding the use of corticosteroids in the management of bacterial meningitis? Is it A, they should be administered in pediatric patients with suspected or confirmed hemophilus influenza meningitis? and continued for a total of two to four days? Or is it B, they shouldn't be administered because they interfere with the antibiotic penetration into the CSF? Or is it C, they should be administered to patients of all ages and should be continued the entire course of antibiotic treatment? Or is it D, they should be administered to adults and pediatric patients with confirmed CSF cultures growing Neisseria meningitidis for two to four days. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. A is the correct answer. They should be administered in pediatric patients with suspected or confirmed hemophilus influenza meningitis and continued for a total of two to four days. Now, I'd like to remind you that corticosteroids are recommended to be administered 10 to 20 minutes prior to the antibiotic therapy for an adult when strep pneumo is suspected or a possible etiology and pediatric patients when hemophilus influenza is suspected or a possible etiology so remember the timing and endeavor to get it right for efficacy let's move to the next question please And it reads, Mr. JMJ, 
A male patient presents to your accident and emergency department with a past medical history of HIV, which is poorly controlled. He is non-adherent to his highly active antiretroviral therapy. His recent CD4 count was 20 cells per mm cubed, and he had a big viral load of 100,000 copies per ml. Today, his chief complaint is headache. He has episodes of confusion, altered mental status. According to the spouse who has accompanied him to your accident and emergency department, a CNS infection was suspected by your clinical team at the A&D, and a lump puncture was performed. It revealed an elevated intracranial pressure, and a lymphocytic prominence was established. The CSF was sent for culture and staining. A cryptococcal antigen and meningoencephalitis PCR panel were ordered by the team at the A&D. So the question is, which of the therapeutic regimens listed below would be the most appropriate empiric management of cryptococcal meningitis in this case? Would it be posaconazole? Delayed release tablets administered orally 300 mg twice daily for two doses followed by 300 once a day. Or would you settle for liposomal amphotericin B dosed at 3 mg per kilo diluted in dextrose 5 and infused over 4 hours? alongside flucytosin dosed at 25 mg per kilo administered four times daily or would you settle for itraconazole administered at a dose of 200 mg orally thrice daily for three doses followed by 200 mg twice a day or would you settle for fluconazole infused at a dose of 800 mg start followed by 400 mg once daily, together with flucytosin, dosed at 25 mg per kilo, four times daily. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. I would settle for B, liposomal amphotericin B, diluted in dextrose 5 and infused over 4 hours at a dose of 3 mg per kilo once a day, alongside 25 mg per kilo of flucytosin administered 4 times daily. The treatment of choice for patients diagnosed with cryptococcal meningitis from that list is liposomal amphotericin B in combination with flucytosin. I'd just like to add that fluconazole can be recommended although not preferred therapy. And uh, the recommended dose in my opinion is 1200 milligrams over 24 hours given with flucytosin. So that dose of 800 would be an underdose. Then itraconazole alone would not be recommended and the IDSA treatment guidelines specifically note its use is discouraged for this particular indication as it was shown to be less effective when compared to fluconazole. And uh, there are limited data on posaconazole use for fungal CNS infections and the PK properties of this agent do not make it a reliable option for CNS infections. So those many words qualify B to be the correct answer. On the next question reads, the clinical microbiologist uploads JMJ's results on the hospital intranet 
and a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis is confirmed with a CSF PCR identifying the presence of cryptococcus. JMJ's clinical and level of immune compromise with the poorly controlled HIV also contribute to this diagnosis. So the question is, for how long should the above antifungal regimen be administered to Mr. J. M. J. Would it be for at least two weeks for induction and then two weeks consolidation therapy and maintenance therapy for six to 12 months? Or would it be at least four weeks for induction, then four weeks of consolidation therapy and the maintenance therapy until HIV is well controlled? Or would it be eight weeks for induction, then two weeks of consolidation therapy and maintenance therapy for six to 12 months? Or would it be at least two weeks for induction and eight weeks of consolidation therapy and maintenance therapy until HIV is well controlled? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. D is the correct answer, at least two weeks for induction, then eight weeks of consolidation therapy and a maintenance therapy until HIV is well controlled. Now, just like to repeat that two weeks of induction and eight weeks of consolidation followed by a maintenance therapy until HIV is controlled is the guideline recommended treatment cause for cryptococcal meningitis. The other listed options, in my opinion, are all incorrect durations of therapy. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the question reads, which of the statements listed below is true or accurate in connection with corticosteroids use as an adjunctive therapy in cryptococcal meningitis. Is it A, corticosteroids should not be administered to patients with cryptococcal meningitis? Or is it B, corticosteroids should be administered to all patients with cryptococcal meningitis during the induction phase of antifungal treatment? Or is it C, Corticosteroids should be administered only to HIV-infected patients during the induction phase of antifungal treatment, or is it D? Corticosteroids should be administered to all patients with cryptococcal meningitis for full course of treatment. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So A is the correct answer. Corticosteroids are not recommended in the setting of cryptococcal meningitis. I'll, I would like to refer you to the 2016 study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which found that dexamethasone use in the setting of cryptococcal meningitis was associated with decreased CSF clearance of cryptococcus. It was also associated with increased rates of death or disability at 10 weeks and at six months and an increased adverse event or increased adverse events. So that disqualifies the use of cryptococcal, sorry, corticosteroids in cryptococcal meningitis. That makes our answer A the correct one. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. D. O. K., a 59-year-old male patient, is rushed to your accident and emergency department by his spouse. He has a past medical history of acute 
myeloid leukemia AML status post allogeneic stem cell transplant two months ago. Currently, he takes tacrolimus for graft versus host disease prophylaxis. He is confused and the spouse witnessed a seizure episode before rushing him to hospital. Mr. D.O.K. has a low risk for CMV at the time of transplantation. Both him and his donor are negative. And uh, Ciclovir prophylaxis is part of his post-transplant protocol to prevent HSV infection. Now, for the past three weeks, he hasn't been taking his Ciclovir. And the emergency medicine consultant emergently does a lumbar puncture after obtaining a negative CT scan and he initiates empiric antimicrobial therapy. So my question to you is, which of the regimens listed below would be the most appropriate in this clinical scenario as the team awaits CSF analysis and culture results? Could it be two grams of ceftriaxone BD plus vancomycin at a dose of 25 to 30 milligrams per kilo times one as a start dose followed by 15 to 20 milligrams per kilo BD plus ampicillin at a dose of two grams infused every four to six hours plus for scanners dosed at 90 milligrams per kilo twice daily or would it be B, cefepime, 2 grams infused over 3 hours, thrice daily, plus vancomycin dose at 25 to 30 milligrams per kilo as a start dose, followed by uh, 15 to 20 milligrams IV after the loading dose, twice daily, plus ampicillin dose at 2 grams infused every four to six hours or would it be cefepime two grams iv thrice daily plus a loading dose of vancomycin at 25 to 30 milligrams per kilo followed by 15 to 20 milligrams per kilo infused twice daily plus ampicillin dosed at uh, two grams infused every four to six hours plus a cyclovir dosed at 10 mg per kilo TID or would you settle for ceftriaxone 2 grams infused once daily over 30 minutes plus vancomycin loaded at 25 to 30 mg per kilo followed by a maintenance dose of 15 to 20 mg per kilo twice daily both infused over 2 hours plus ampicillin dosed at 2 grams infused every 4 to 6 hours plus gencyclovir dosed at 5 mg per kilo twice daily. I'll give you 10 seconds to ponder over it and choose the correct regimen. So C would be the best option in this clinical scenario. Given the patient's presentation, while awaiting the CSF analysis and culture results, they should be started on bacterial meningitis coverage in addition to viral encephalitis coverage. Uh, patients presenting with focal neurologic deficits and confusion uh, should be started on anti- virus empirically and acyclovir would be the most pertinent antiviral to initiate in this particular clinical scenario since HSV and VZV are more likely pathogens in case of a viral infection and uh, it is specifically noted that uh, this patient's risk for CMV is low 
Therefore, for ganciclovir or foscanet would only be options in a scenario where CMV was suspected. And unfortunately, it is not the case here. So I would settle for cefepime, vancomycin, and acyclovir alongside ampicillin. So there you have it, my highly esteemed viewers and listeners. That brings us to the end of this video. If this video benefited you in any way, I would like to humbly urge you to give it a thumbs up, to like it, to share it widely with your peers and to leave your comments at its very bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video and for listening to me. And I sincerely appreciate your partnership, your continued support and your very kind collaboration. And I look forward to interacting with you in part 120 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series. Thank you.